Hi, welcome to Bigelow. I am ecstatic to be here. This is a kind of a dream job come true. And what I'm going to tell you about today is a little bit about myself. I'm new in the community, and so um, how did I get here to be standing in front of you? I'm going to tell you about nitrogen, the best element in the world, which has been the focus of my own research. Tell you kind of the methods and how the approaches I've used um, over the last 25 years as an oceanographer, and then end up with uh, a story of... Um, the Arctic, and one of my favorite kind of discoveries are you don't go out planning to, to do that, and you kind of take a hunch, and you say you're going to do something, and it really pays off, and that's kind of one of the stories I'm going to show you today. So first, I started in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm going to take you a tour of my life. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so I can say go and car and oh no, I don't want the brat. Um, <laughs> I, uh, one of the reasons I feel so comfortable in Maine is that I spent every summer in far northern Wisconsin, which looks and smells an awful lot like Maine. Um, so this, also, I sort of feel like a summer vacation, only I'm working like 80 hours a week. Um, <laughs> From there, I, I dreamed of being in oceanography when I was a little kid, uh, but I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Again, nowhere near the ocean. Um, so if you put me in a room of Southerners, I can, I can slide right back into that real easy with like, I'm fixing to carry my daughter to the store. And uh, not, not really the accent you want to be viewed as a successful scientist, sadly, sadly. Um, I went to, um, oh, I, again, from the time I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to study ocean, and I did it, I, I came to that realization because of the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, and I always like to give Jacques Cousteau kudos for that, because if you ever wonder exposing your kids to, um, to experiences, what it can do, and that planted the seed that led me here directly today, I can pretty much say I wouldn't be an oceanographer if it wasn't ha having um, exposure to that wonderful show. I went to Miami, University of Miami, for my um, undergraduate, where I majored in marine science, biology, and I was this close to chemistry, um, and had a great time down there, and then I went to the University of Maryland um, for my PhD. I worked on Chesapeake Bay, which is kind of a, the nirvana for nitrogen, mostly because there's so many nutrient, bad nutrient issues in the Chesapeake Bay region. From there, I crossed country, went to the West Coast, to University of California at Santa Cruz, where um, I learned that I was kind of an East Coast girl. It was a great place to live, but I, didn't, I wasn't going to stay there. Ended up my first faculty job at the University of Georgia. Moved on to the University of Virginia. I, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. My, all my friends at the College of William & Mary are turning over right now. The College of William & Mary, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, where I spent the last 17 years. And I think it's really a tribute to this amazing institution that anything could have pried me out of them because I really enjoyed my time there and loved, loved my time there. And then in January, I drove with my sister, my four dogs, and my Prius, um, and I moved to Maine. <laughs> I moved to Maine, and it turns out that's a great time to move to Maine because in a small town like this, not a lot happens in the winter. And so you are welcomed with open arms. It's like there's a new face in town. So, um, and I, some of my favorite people, I bought a house out on Barter's Island, and my favorite people went, <laughs> ooh, okay, there's... See, I mean, I've only been here four months. I have those kind of friends because Barter, Barter's Island has a potluck every month, and it's so, it's, it's very fun. So, um, moving on, but that's none of that travel and the research I did during that time are the reason why I think Bigelow hired me for this job. Um, but I had two experiences that I think uh, prepared me pretty well. I don't know if anything can prepare you of leading an institute like this, but these are my formative experiences. One was I was elected president of the Association for the Sciences of Limnology, the Study of Inland Waters and Lakes, and Oceanography. And science societies um, play a very important role in the lives of scientists. They often publish the scientific journals that we publish in. They have the national meet put on the national meetings that we go and present our work and listen to the work of others and have our friends beat up when they don't like our graphs and think we did it the wrong way. And all of those exchanges that allows us to hone our ideas all happen in these science meetings. And so for six years, I was one kind of president or another of ASLO. And um, one of the best parts of that is I traveled all around the country and I can't say around the world, but a lot of places in the world. And I looked at and met people at marine institutions and visited marine institutions. And that's why I can say definitively that Bigelow is one of the finest oceanographic institutions in the world. 
it's amazing. So because of my role that I played at, at, um, in ASLO, I was nominated to serve at the National Science Foundation. So NSF is the smallest federal agency, I believe. It's about 1,200 people. It has a budget of $7.5 billion this year. Sounds like a lot of money. We spend $7.5 billion on potato chips every year. Actually, it's probably more than that now. That data is from 2015. One of the amazing things about NSF is that half of the science staff at any given time were people like me. I was a practicing researcher. I had my own lab. I, I traveled up to DC and I spent two and a half years serving. I kind of think of it as the marine science military in that sense. <laughs> I was the director of the Division of Ocean Science. And in that capacity, I managed a budget of $356 million, which is, again, a lot of money. But we manage programs in biological, chemical, and physical oceanography. Many of the scientists in this building are funded through NSF and the ocean sciences. And it's the hardest and the best money to get because it really gives you the freedom to follow what you are finding. Um, we also did marine geology and geophysics, ocean technology, the US fleet. We uh, managed many parts of the US fleet ocean drilling, the list goes on, and that $356 million doesn't go that far when you're trying to fund that many different things. So I got really interested in how as a country can we get cheaper, faster, better, quicker at answering questions, at coming up with questions, answering them, and then getting those, that information out to people that can, that can solve the problems that the ocean is facing. So anyways, I'm there at NSF. I end my term, I go, I sleep for like a month when I got home, I got back into my research, and then I got a call from Patty Matry. Patty Matry from the movie. Patty and I spent six years working on As at ASLO. Um, she was the treasurer when I was president, and we basically had to remake that organization, so we were in the trenches together. And she called me and said, we want to bring you up to Bigelow to give a seminar. So in the summer of 2016, I came to Bigelow. And it was like I walked into the institution I had been envisioning in that it didn't look like a lot of university labs that I had visited or other marine labs that I visited. Um, and so I was really inspired by it. We don't have departments. We, everybody's kind of in one big group. We don't have a huge support staff. And believe me, the support staff tells me we don't have a huge support staff. For every one PhD level scientist, we only have one support staff person here, which is very lean. Um, we shove a lot of people, a lot of scientists together in a small space so they can't help but talk with each other. So anyways, I'm up here and I'm just blown away by this institution. And then sadly, with the passing of Graham Shamil, he, um, I was contacted by the headhunter and they said, would you be interested in applying? And I stood there for a very long time. <laughs> And she even says, are you still on the line? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I want to apply. And um, I'm just ecstatic to, to be standing up in front of you. That was probably, I probably digressed too long on that. But I'm really excited. I'm really passionate about NSF, and I'm really passionate about this place. So here's the beautiful lab. Like I said, I, I moved up here in January. I bought a house out on Botters Island, and it's been a, a thrilling ride ever since. This is an amazing group of people, amazing group of scientists. It's just like a candy store if you're a science geek. So now I'm going to talk about, so Bigelow is my current love, my first love in science, and that is nitrogen, the best element in the world, no matter what Ben Twining tries to tell you about iron. So why nitrogen? What's so great about nitrogen? Every living organism on the planet, as far as we know, needs nitrogen. You can't live without it. As human beings, we get our nitrogen from protein. So things like fried chicken, broccoli, which has a bizarre large amount of protein, I've always thought. That's how we have to get our, our, our nitrogen aliquot. But if you're a microbe in the ocean, you are swimming in the seawater, and that seawater has nitrogen compounds of various different varieties everywhere in there. And so how they use that nitrogen, how they take it up into their bodies, and watch this. <laughs> We're going to do that one more time. <laughs> okay. You know when you have this long, long list of things to do and you're not going to make it through the whole thing that day and you, then you just decide to get fixated on doing something stupid that takes forever? That's what you've just witnessed. <laughs> 
so my research has focused um, for the last, what, 25 plus years on how organisms, these microbes, phytoplankton, tiny microscopic plants and bacteria in the ocean take up nitrogen, what mechanisms they use, what kind of nitrogen they use, um, and, and how they process it internally. And because you and study nitrogen this way, you can learn how fast organisms are growing, and that really is controlling the base of the food chain in the ocean. Another thing that I work on is where it's coming from. So there's two main sources that come from um, biology. So this is a little copepod, and they excrete nitrogen. This one didn't quite, quite as long, but it's not as flashy. So these are, they look like little grains of sand, and if you get a bunch of seawater, you can generally see them occasionally. Copepods, they're important food for higher, uh, higher trophic levels, and they excrete nitrogen after, as they eat the phytoplankton. Nitrogen also comes from land. It can run, just overland runoff. It can come out through rivers. There are a number of different sources of nitrogen. So a lot of my work is also focused on looking at that. And then, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I got asked to be a consultant from, by the state um, on wastewater treatment plants. And it turns out the organic nitrogen fraction, which is kind of my area of expertise, is a billion dollar question in the Chesapeake Bay region. And the question is, does this organic fraction, is it, is it used by organisms if you put it out in the environment? Or is it just this kind of refractory, old refractory stuff that isn't gonna really go anywhere? So, I've spent the last 10 years doing some really basic studies of how nitrogen is processed in these wastewater treatment plants. And I gotta say, when I started working in wastewater treatment plants, I was a little cocky. I'm like Miss Oceanography nitrogen person. And um, the wastewater treatment plant engineers just handed me my butt because they know nitrogen cycling like I have never seen anybody know nitrogen cycling. What happens in these plants are amazing. So actually some of my very favorite projects have been in these wastewater treatment plants. It's also thrilling to take all that I've learned in the ocean and apply it to something that is a real problem that we are trying to figure out how to make these plants more efficient. So you can see, you know, answer some questions and do some, um, oftentimes when you do basic research, you don't see the end point right in front of you because you're on the next question. But in wastewater treatment work, I've been able to really make an impact. Okay, so how do I do this work? One of the basic tools that I use in studying the nitrogen cycle is isotopic tracers. So our bodies are made up of primarily N14 nitrogen. That's the, that's the atomic weight of that nitrogen atom. But we can chemically manufacture, oop, wait. We can chemically manufacture N15 labeled nitrogen, and it's just a little heavier than the regular nitrogen. And because it's heavier, we can trace where it goes and how fast it goes. So as an example, I don't know if this is gonna work. I was trying to figure out how to talk about a tracer. So say if you had a whole crowd of guys in dark suits, it's hard to kind of tell them apart, but if you wanted to watch where one guy is going, you could put a red sombrero on them, <laughs> right? So N15 is like the red sombrero um, that we use to follow where nitrogen, I'm so glad Bob Healing's sitting in the front because he's, <laughs> he laughed at the red sombrero. I wasn't sure anyone would. But so that's how we can tag that nitrogen. Because we can tag that nitrogen, we can then determine, um, watch how fast it's taken up into cells. So the way we do this work is we've put something called a CTD over the side of the ship. Each one of these gray cylinders is almost as tall as I am, it's about this big around, and it's open on either side. And we put, this, we put this instrument over the side, and as it goes down into the water, it's measuring all these different characteristics of the water, whether it's fluorescence, which can, which can tell you where the phytoplankton are, temperature, salinity, how much salt is in the water. And then everybody runs inside and looks at the screen on all these different variables. And then we decide where we're gonna collect our water to try to figure out where we want to study things. And then we shut the bottles as it's coming up at those depths. And so when it comes back on, sh on deck, you've got water from all different depths trapped in these different cylinders. Then we can collect all the water. We mix, sometimes we'll mix them all together into one, um, into one carboy, and then we fill up our sample bottles. And basically, those, we're going to fill those up with seawater from different depths, and then we add our N15 labeled ammonium or nitrate or whatever compound we're looking at into that bottle. We cap the bottle and we put them, we incubate it in a number of ways. Oftentimes it's just a big plexiglass bathtub. 
Um, we've got hoses that will keep the water at the same temperature as the water in the surface ocean. Sometimes we heat that water, sometimes we cool that water. We want those microbes in that bottle to think they're still in the ocean. At the end of it, we, f we bring it inside. Here's our bottle. We bring it inside and we filter it through, the, through a filter to collect all of those organisms that were in that bottle. So if here's our filter, what we're looking for is those red sombreros. We're looking for which more, what organisms on that filter have taken up that N15. If that filter contains a lot of N15, that means the uptake rate was high, and those cells are growing fast to be taken up nitrate that fast. Um, if we do different kinds of substrates, different types of nitrogen, it can tell us a lot about the system on what kind of nitrogen they're using. So I've done this kind of work all over the world. So we've got, um, I made four trips to Antarctica, um, a couple trips to the Equatorial Pacific, the South Pacific, lots of cruises off of um, the coast of California and the Pacific Northwest. Um, a number of experiments were done in Norway. Norway has this amazing mesocosm facility where they have these giant bags sitting in a fjord that you can, each one can look like a little mini ocean and you can manipulate them. Um, I'm going to tell you later on about the work up in the Alaska, but also Gulf of Mexico, all through the Caribbean, Chesapeake Bay, um, and other regions. So this next, the first study I'm going to tell you, just to give you an illustration of the kind of work that we're talking about, is this was DOTGOM, the Daughters of Trichonauts in the Gulf of Mexico. And I put this in because this was the first big grant that me and a number of colleagues, including Cindy Heil, who is a researcher here, um, we got our own project. And um, we were following up on a whole slew of studies that we had done as graduate students, and we kind of brought it all together. And we were in the Gulf of Mexico, and we were studying fish kills. So there's a, a massive problem in Florida with fish kills and these blooms of a harmful algae called Carinia brevis, which produces a neurotoxin. And it was a mystery because they couldn't figure out how to get enough nitrogen from all the various sources, whether it was offshore, upwelling, overland runoff from the atmosphere, into the ocean to make so many cells. They could not do that. So we got funded to go out and do it. Well, we couldn't do it either. No, no matter how many kind of as crazy assumptions we could make with all of the rates we were measuring, we couldn't get enough nitrogen to make all those cells. And it turned, so we went and did a second project, and this time we brought physicists with us, physical oceanographers. And what it turns out is it's a combination of two things. One, you've got all these different sources of nitrogen coming in, and these Karenia brevis start blooming. There's a lot of them in the water, but they're not enough to start killing fish. But then, physics gets into play, and you get different wind current, wind patterns will push that water together to form a front, and they concentrate those cells. When they get concentrated enough, they kill a fish. And what are fish? Giant bags of nitrogen. Once you start killing a few fish, it's like a runaway train. Um, and they just, they die, more nitrogen, more cells, and that's why these blooms are so persistent in Florida. So with that, that's the first half of my talk. And before I went on to the um, Arctic material, I wanted to see if anybody had any questions. Mm -hmm. Up to um, Barrow, Alaska, or, or um, Ukiavik, I hope I said that right, Ukiavik, which is the um, Inupiat name that they have now changed Barrow, Alaska to. It is the northernmost part point of the um, United States. Uh, it's the northernmost village. There's about 4,000 people there. And my, me and my lab group have done a number of projects out of Barrow, Alaska over the years. Um, we call ourselves the nitrogen snow ninjas. I'm the fierce one in the middle. This is my lab manager, Quinn. And this is Stephen Bear. So Stephen Bear, um, when he finished his PhD, he came to Bigelow. I don't know if he's in the audience somewhere. He came to Bigelow and is now a postdoc here. So it's been really fun to come back and kind of he's my academic son. So we um, went up to Barrow, Alaska, and we had th field trips in three seasons. Um, the first one is winter. So here's a shot of us on the frozen ocean. Um, you can see a little bit of the sun over here. Barrow is, have any of you seen 30 Days of Night, the absolutely horrifying and gruesome vampire movie? <laughs> we will, okay, so it's set in, no, you haven't, but I'm gonna tell you about it. We, it's set in Barrow, Alaska, and the idea is when the sun goes down in Barrow, 
in, uh, at the end of November. The sun doesn't come back up until the end of January, so it's like a field day for vampires. <laughs> and um, and it, we watched it during the 30, well, actually 60 days of night, in reality, in Barrow, and I gotta tell you, it was, it was horrible. I don't like scary movies. <laughs> Anyways, this is about two o'clock in the afternoon, so this is as light as it gets, and you can see we've got lights going on here, but in reality, because everything's white, if there's any moon at all, you can read outside. So I, I did not expect how, how bright it would be. Um, on this particular day, it was about minus 42 um, below zero. So at that, you can throw water up into the air, and by the time it lands, it's frozen. So when people are saying, are you really going to move to Maine in, in January? I was like, I got this. This is nothing. <laughs> this is what our sites look like in spring. So again, this is the frozen ocean. When we go out with the snowmobiles or snow machines out onto the ice, we dig, um, we drill holes into the ice, and then we actually put up little tents around it with a heater in it, not to heat it up, but we don't want our water freezing instantly when it comes out of the hole. Um, and so it was, I guess we made um, two trips in the winter, two trips in spring, and then the data I'm gonna, or the, the information I'm gonna show you is from summer. And so we made two trips on summer where we did not, which I did not actually, um, I much prefer the cold winter because this was a really small boat and, um, and it was really rough out there. Anyway, so we're up in summer and the project that we were working on initially, our initial project, we were funded because the Arctic is warming. So the Arctic air and the Arctic water is warming up. Now normally that's a really good thing for, for microbes. If you turn up, if you crank up the temperature for microbial organisms, they usually grow faster. They like warmer temperatures in general. One of the implications of this increasing temperature, though, is that you've got, um, it's melting the ice. Now, for phytoplankton, that also is not a bad thing, because phytoplankton need light. And as you're melting that ice, more, ice, more light is getting into the ocean that the phytoplankton can use. Another implication, though, is it's also melting the permafrost. So this is just showing a, a bank going into the coastal ocean from the tundra. This was all, at one point, frozen. So if you think about it, this was like just kind of a concrete slab of frozen water. And all of that organic matter, if you think about the organic matter in your yard, the leaf litter, in your compost pile, all that organic material up in the tundra has been frozen solid in this, in this um, permafrost. Well, now it's melting. And as it's melting and that ice turns to water, the material is flowing into the coastal ocean. And it's doing two things. The first is it's colored. And it's shutting down the light for the phytoplankton. The second is it's putting a lot of carbon. So phytoplankton get their carbon from carbon dioxide, right? They're plants, just like the plants in your yard are taking up carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. But bacteria use organic carbon from the water. So I'm going to see if this will work. So the organic carbon is sort of like a pizza crust, right? You can eat a pizza crust, but you don't really want to eat a pizza crust by itself. And this organic carbon that's coming in that the bacteria are using, they really can't use it very well unless they have cheese, and nitrogen is the cheese. <laughs> does, that, does that work? And I'm, and I'm a cheese girl from Wisconsin. So, so the, the impact of this is, as all this organic carbon is coming into the ocean, the bacteria are are being fierce competitors for what nitrogen is out there, and they're fighting with it with the, back, with the phytoplankton. And so what's happening is all the nitrogen is getting used up, or it's getting used up a lot faster. It's producing a lot more cells, right? The cells are growing faster, but they're taking all that nitrogen that's available up. But not all of it. So now ta everybody take a deep breath. Okay, 78% of what you just breathed in is nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is, is uh, uh, kind of a gnarly compound. It's two nitrogen atoms um, triple bonded together, and these triple bonds are very strong. So when you breathed in that nitrogen, you couldn't do anything with it, right? You still gotta eat your fried chicken or your broccoli to get your nitrogen. But there are some organisms in the ocean that have the metabolic machinery that can break that triple bond. And once they break that triple bond and take it up into their own bodies, it's in the system. It can, because they can be eaten, they can die and decay, and that nitrogen can be used by other organisms. It's the one way to get new nitrogen 
into the ocean, or actually onto the planet, is breaking apart that nitrogen gas. So if you think about it from the perspective in the ocean, you've got nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, everything's got to be in equilibrium, right? So you've got nitrogen in the atmosphere, you've got nitrogen in the ocean in equilibrium. And this nitrogen normally just hangs out, nothing happens, unless the organisms out there, the microorganisms that are out there are very, very short of nitrogen. And it suddenly become, it makes sense for them to expend all this energy to break it apart. Nitrogen fixation is normally, I'm going to go back so you don't look at that right away because you won't focus on me because there's a hairy guy in a speedo. So, so nitrogen fixation is a fantastic process to work on because we only thought it occurred in the tropics or maybe the temperate zones. And so you kind of can go island hopping. So this is my very first cruise I ever took out of the University of Miami as a graduate student. Here I am, very pale, <laughs> I never could tan. And this is Doug Capone, who is one of my favorite people in the world. And today I can assure you that there would never be a chief scientist on a US research vessel wearing a Speedo in the cruise photo. But this was, this, was the, this was the 80s, and we had just finished all the work, and we were all packed up, and we had a few hours. So everybody put their bathing suit on and was just kind of hanging out on the deck. So that is, that's what you look normally think you're going to get on a cruise that you study nitrogen fixation. In the Arctic, this is what you look like. So you're on this little boat where you feel like you're going to die, and you're wearing Mustang suits. But the idea behind even doing this work was, I was thinking one day, while well, we were, um, shortly before we went up for another field trip in the summer, well, if everything's running out of nitrogen, I just wonder if nitrogen fixation could be there. It's not supposed to happen where it's cold, but let's give it a try. And this is how we make this measurement. Again, it, this is using that N15, that heavy nitrogen. So we take a water sample in a bottle like this. It's got a gas-tight top, and this is a tank of N15. Um, labeled gas, and here's the syringe that would use to pull some of that gas out and squirt into the bottle. And the toughest part of this whole project was actually getting that tank into Barrow, Alaska, because it looks like a pipe bomb. <laughs> and I'm only telling you this because it really, one of the one of the things I love about oceanographers is you got to be scrappy, because a big part of doing work in the ocean is figuring out everything you need, right? There's no Walmart, where there's no Walmart here either, but there's no, there's no store, so you need to have everything you need for every contingency you can think of when you go out in the field. Um, and then you've got to get all that stuff. Oftentimes it's toxic, it looks like a bomb, and you've got to get that anywhere in the world. And so oceanographers are some of the scrappiest people in terms of, um, in terms of getting something that kind of sounds impossible done. Anyways, we did that. And we found nitrogen fixation. So then we were funded for a cruise to find out how widespread it is. This is the ship we were using. This was the RV Sekuliak, research vessel Sekuliak. If you're a taxpayer, you helped pay for this ship. This is part of the US research fleet, and she's a beautiful, amazing ship. And this is the, my research group that went out there, including a couple of visiting graduate students. And I've shown you two pictures of research groups, and they've all been women, but I can assure you that men do work in oceanography. And we're really welcoming of them. <laughs> it's probably not. It's probably, might be. Okay, so um, let me get back up to, to the ship again. So the Sekuliak is a big ship, and we didn't have, we didn't need that many people to do the work. So one of the things about um, oceanography pretty much anywhere in the country, is they will fill up that ship with as many different people as they can get on there. So we were partnered with another group. We took samples for colleagues all over the place. We brought on graduate students for dissertations. And it's, again, I think one of the wonderful things about oceanography is it's a very altruistic. If you can help somebody, you do. Because access to the ocean, especially these remote sites, is so precious. So we um, were partnered with, this, with these other groups, and we have this cruise track. We left from Nome, Alaska. We went across the top of Alaska. This is the, Bering, um, this is the Beaufort Sea. This would be the Chukchi Sea. And we just did these transects on and off to see where we could find nitrogen fixation. And what's really exciting, we did not, it sh according to dogma, it shouldn't be up there at all. But we found it 
um, many places, mostly along the coast. And so our, our hypothesis that it's this material flowing off the land into the ocean that is using up all the nitrogen because it's adding this carbon, it's adding this pizza crust into the coast, that those microbes, those bacteria that want to use that carbon are going to take up the available nitrogen so that they can. And so, okay, right now you're supposed to be like, that's amazing, because if you're a nitrogen person, you'd be thinking, that's amazing. <laughs> It, it's really thrilling. Okay, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, so what? <laughs> so what? And this, for me, is a big so what, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bad news in studies nowadays of parts of the ocean that are changing or being polluted or being damaged in ways. And I think this might be an example of one of the ways that the ocean is, is responding to that in, in almost a healing way. So what am I talking about? So CO2. Just like nitrogen gas, CO2 in the atmosphere is in equilibrium with CO2 in the ocean. And one thing about CO2 is every time I drive my car, every time I turn on my heat, every time I do just about anything with electricity, I am pumping CO2 in the atmosphere. And that CO2 is increasing and increasing and increasing. And with that increase, we are thickening that blanket of greenhouse gases around our planet. A blanket we couldn't live if we didn't have, but now we're making it much thicker. So because we are finding this process in the ocean, I think there's a lot of potential for improving the situation. Okay, so you've got your CO2. It's, some of it's dissolved in the water, and that CO2 is taken up into phytoplankton. Okay, so that's a good thing. And the more CO2 you take up into phytoplankton, the more nitrogen you need because you can't take up carbon without that nitrogen. So what we are showing is there's a new source that's not in any of the global models right now, it's not in any of our understanding of it, that is providing more nitrogen that will allow this arrow to get bigger, to allow more carbon dioxide to be taken up into those cells. And the more carbon, that, carbon dioxide that's taken up from the water, the more CO2 will come in from the atmosphere. But it's important that this is happening in the Arctic, and that's because the Arctic is shallow. Now, if all that happens is that CO2 goes in there and then these phytoplankton cells get eaten, eventually it just goes back to CO2. You need to really get rid of that carbon for the time scale that matters to us as human beings. You've got to take that carbon and remove it. And in the Arctic, it's very shallow. So if you look at a map of an Arctic, and I, I had one in here, but I didn't think people in the back could see it. There are broad continental shelves all around the Arctic, and there's really only a deep basin in the very center where it's too cold. Nobody's going to want to live much there anyways. But this, this very broad continental shelf is important because if you're in the middle of the Pacific, for example, and you're an organism and you take up carbon, the chances of you getting that carbon all the way down and buried in the sediment is extremely tiny. In the Arctic, it doesn't have to go that far, right? It, and, and some of our sites, you know, we are way, way offshore, and we're only in 30, 40 meters of water. So it's a very shallow area. So taking up carbon from the atmosphere into the water, into a cell, and then burying it in the ground is much more likely to happen there. It also, phytoplankton, can, once that material is down on the bottom, it can also go into... Um, other organisms, like crabs, that can be harvested. And I know these are blue crabs, they are not in the Arctic, don't yell at me, that's just the picture that I found. What happens, though, if this material is going into something you can harvest, like a crab, or a flounder, or a fish, is that you are pulling that carbon out of the ocean, which means you've taken carbon from the atmosphere, to the ocean, to a cell, and you've removed it. And over time in the Arctic, if this nitrogen fixation expands, you're going to be able to remove more carbon, and that's a good thing for the planet. And I just want to end with this, this point about the planet, in that, again, we have this, we have this um, very protective atmosphere around it, but we're putting more and more stuff into that atmosphere that's warming everything up. And processes like this, I think, are good news. In a way, it's showing the Earth responding, in a way, to these changes that's going to reverse some of that CO2, I hope, long term. And with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. This is, this is not the easiest time to be an oceanographer right now. There's a, there's a lot of bad news. Anytime a scientist today does anything with carbon, we can kind of get beat up about that, and yet the ocean is the climate. Um, 
Did I say climate? I said carbon. I don't know, I'm losing my track of thought here. Stay focused. So, so it's really important when people, you know, come out and just want to hear about our science. It gives us a shot in the arm. It, it, it gives us a shot in the arm. And so I want to thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to ask any questions. And thank you for coming and out to Bigelow today. <laughs>